Campbell. There's no secret. There's no shortcut. Everything that is alive is conscious. Be silent. Be still and know God. Until you feel worthy, it ain't going to happen. Rigorous, ruthless, disciplined focus. You have to get to a place where you can work on yourself. If you are looking to live at the tip of the spear when it comes to health optimization, join my private membership group, Fully Optimized Health. Dot com and get the latest and greatest on hormone optimization, peptides, fitness, fat loss, and most importantly, raising your vibration. Again, go over to fullyoptimizedhealth.com and sign up today. Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you may be around the world. I am Jay Campbell, and of course, you are watching the Jay Campbell podcast. And I'm very excited today to be joined in my StreamYard virtual studio with an amazing young woman by the name of... Dr. Loretta Bruning, who is a PhD, and Loretta is actually joining us here today. She is the founder of the Inner Mammal Institute and author of Habits of a Happy Brain, Retrain Your Brain to Boost Your Serotonin, Dopamine, Oxytocin, and Endorphin Levels. So this is going to be an amazing podcast here today. Uh, Loretta, how are you? Great. Thank you. Um, You've called me young, so I'll accept that. (laughs) That's right. You're only as old as you believe yourself to be, correct? Uh, Yes, Um, (laughs) although there is also physical reality. (laughs) That's true. There is physical reality. We are limited by the walls of space and time in the third dimension. Um, So honestly, it's amazing to have you here today. Um, You know, as I've been doing on the Jay Campbell podcast uh, with all my amazing guests is recently, you know, due to the uh, complexity, I would say, of the world right now, depending on your perception, um, just give me your general take before we get into your talking points of like where we are. And by the way, today for the record is Thursday, October 13th, uh, of course, 2022. Uh, but you know, I've been having a really interesting conversation, just kind of getting people's takes on where we are right now, you know, from a conscious standpoint, um, you know, on the planet, like where do you see humanity going say, you know, next two to three to five to 10 years? Sure. Okay. Um, Well, I'd like to talk about this thing I call um, the hell in a handbasket mindset. So this is a mindset that is very widespread. And I realized that it was taught to me in college. So you're sort of predisposed to look for evidence that everything's going to hell in a handbasket. When you look for it, you find it. And then you feel bad on the one hand, but on the other hand, then you connect to other people who are thinking that. So Mm -hmm. that gives you a pretty bad choice. And when I realized that it was just a habit, that there were plenty of good things going on that would get ignored because then you're not connecting to the mindset. So I decided that I would rather not be part of this mindset. And that's why I was studying how the brain works and why the brain goes toward the negative. And I would rather not be in the negative. And if other people are, I'd rather be alone than be dragged down in that way. (laughs) Right. I mean, I like that viewpoint. I mean, everything is energy and frequency, you know, so, you know, the walls of the quantum, you know, tell us that, you know, like attracts like, right. Everybody's heard the statement, your vibe attracts your tribe. Right. So, you know, ultimately where we place our thoughts is the reality we create. I mean, we really are the reality creator as the observer. I mean, you know, people talk about the I am consciousness. I mean, the I am is the observer. So we can create whatever reality we see for each other. But as you were saying, the laws of third dimensional space time also do play a role. So as much as we want to create that fifth dimensional or higher, uh, you know, aspect of our existence, we still have an ego and we still have a physical body. And so it still pulls us, you know, again, back, I guess, within the laws of space time. So that's a great, um, that's a great uh, way to live your life. Um, You know, it's true. I mean, I'm the same way, by the way, I just create, you know, all day in my studios. I'm blessed to speak with people like you on Thursdays when I do podcasts with people, but uh, you really, it is, it is a choice and it must be a conscious choice to, you know, only associate yourself with people that have a similar mindset or attitude that you do, because you're right. I mean, especially in today's day and age with what's happening in the last like two and a half years, you know, it's pretty simple to get caught up into whatever you want to call uh, the periphery. 
right? Yeah, I don't listen to the news in any way. No. I completely don't participate in this whole narrative, any of those narratives. Yeah, no, I'm with you. And that's actually the strategy. And, I, you know, in my private groups, I tell people the same thing. I said, you have to choose to opt out. You know, there was a great movie. I want to say way back in the day um, with, with what's his name? Matthew Broderick, when he was just a little kid, and it was, uh, it was called War Games. And they were attempting to teach the AI, which obviously Hollywood always ciphers us uh, with movies to try to give us like bigger, more intention principles and meaning. But uh, the, the computer was playing global thermal nuclear war. And in every scenario and permutation, uh, as it ran its algorithm, everything died, everything was blown up. And so eventually at the end, the computer said to Joshua, who was the com uh, professor that Matthew Broderick was like idolizing, uh, the only way to win is not to play. And so it's like the whole like symbol, the symbolism of it is that it, for all of us, in order to not play this third dimensional game, we must choose to opt out. And the op to opt out is to not pay attention. Like you said, you can't watch the news. You can't listen to the internet. I mean, again, we're here. And people will send us text messages and emails of things. And, you know, as soon as you click in, it's like, oh, you're pulled into it. <laughs> yeah. Although, <laughs> um, can, I, <laughs> can I say some, you mentioned ego. Can I say something about ego? Yeah. So I took yoga for some number of years and got a lot of messaging about how ego is bad. But when I studied the animal brain that we all have inside us, I learned that Ego is the center processing of your perception. So each right. brain relates the information of the outside world to itself and to its own survival needs. That's okay. how the brain works. So if you go with this sort of high and mighty concept of ego is bad and I'm going to kill my ego, no. it's like you're telling your inner mammal that you want to kill it because right. it's always worried, am I going to survive? And you're saying, no, I don't care about you. I only care about other people. Right. Right. No, it's absolutely true. The ego, you know, um, Ryan Holiday wrote the book, Ego is the Enemy, and it's completely wrong. Uh, ego is what allows you to survive, right? I mean, 2,000 years ago on the Serengeti, without the ego, you'd have been eaten by a saber-toothed tiger or whatever else was around. So, yeah, absolutely. But it's, you know, essentially, we want to be able to harness the ego. You know, I like to say, and we are going to get to your points here in a second, but I like to say you want to get to a place where you can respond out of love versus react out of fear. And most people react out of fear. You know, if we're looking at the vibrational scale, you know, you're calibrating consciousness. Uh, most people, for the most part, stay down here. And it's for the reasons that you already said. They're hooked into the news. They're hooked into, you know, whatever fear of porn programming is available. Uh, and then they stay in that, you know, level of consciousness, unfortunately. But you're right. I mean, you, you really do have to, you know, the, the, the path is to raise your consciousness so that you can get to a place where you can mostly choose out of fear. I, I mean, choose to re respond out of love and not react out of fear. But obviously, as you just said, you know, we are in a third dimension and every now and then something happens when you're driving down the road and somebody cuts you off. It almost kills you, right? So you grip the steering wheel, but you could still choose to say, wow, you must be having a really bad day. I send you love, right? Yes. That's the key. All right, yes. cool. Very cool. Uh, okay. So, uh, the first point that we have here today, uh, you know, relying to the book that you wrote and just some of the research that you've done is how to retrain your brain in the right way. I really like that. Can you, you know, elaborate on that? Sure. So we're all born with billions of neurons, but they're not connected to each other. So animals are born hardwired, but humans and monkeys, like the bigger your brain is, the less it's born hardwired. That's the whole point of having a big brain is that you're not pre-programmed with the survival skills of your ancestors, but you learn survival skills from lived experience. But in the state of nature, like your parents died young. So nature is in, a, is in a hurry to wire you up really young. So most people, they think they learned everything after they left home, but really you were wired in childhood and puberty. Mm -hmm. So we all face the world with this neural network built in childhood and puberty. And it's better than being, like I said, hardwired, like with the programming of your distant ancestors, but still everyone ends up with some neural pathways that don't serve them. So you may find like, why don't we do this? Or 
why do I love that when it's not really good for me? And whenever you see these responses, you will look, if you look in your early experience, you'll see some obvious reason how you learned that. And it's just a pathway. And when you know that it's just a pathway, then you could say, well, what pathway would I rather have? And the simple answer is that repetition is what builds new pathways. Beautiful. Yeah, I, I liken that to, um, you know, just the idea of the develop. Most people are developmentally disabled in one way, shape, or form. Like you said, between before they're before they're eight years old. You know, it, it's like four to six, six to eight. There's all these things that happen to us, uh, you know, in, in 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 our youth with our parents or with peers or you know things that happen to us, and and we are. Uh, you know, I would, I, I, it's not always stunted, but a lot of people become stunted and then they take those patterns and behaviors and just kind of internal, uh, I would almost call them hidden motives, like into their adult life. And so you see a lot of people who are, uh, emotionally call it, uh, you know, delayed or disabled or something around those things that happened to them early in their life that again, you know, uh, I wouldn't call it terrorized, but, but definitely characterize a lot of their adult behaviors. Um, and, and I mean, I, I mean, I've seen it in, you know, people, my own family and, uh, with my parents and stuff like that. And so it's, it's, it's kind of, a, it, it's kind of effort. It takes effort first off to become aware, self-aware of that. And then secondarily to actually want to, I would you know call it integrate, you know, whatever that issue is for you. And, uh, you know, I see it, um, I don't know. I, I, I see it a lot of myself now, you know, I see some of the stuff that like I inherited or slash learned, you know, from my parents' behaviors. And so it's very, very interesting to see like, you know, you know, you know, the statement of like, you become more and more like your parents as you get older. Uh, there's obviously a lot of truth to that. So it's, you know, obviously, you know, there's good and bad, but it's recognizing, I would say the bad and attempting to like overcome or integrate, you know, I like the word integrate, but to integrate that issue or those issues that you have again, up, upon becoming self-aware. Yeah. So, um, but if most people are this way, then it would be fair to say that it's the norm. It's not like yeah. we have to pathologize everybody and say that something is wrong with everybody, but we could benefit from the self-acceptance of saying this is how the brain works. And we're lucky to have that ability to sort of tailor the brain we have, but we don't need to condemn ourselves because right. in, in all through human history, you had to learn skills from your parents. And so, and the brain is always learning from rewards and threats. That's how the brain works. Anything that feels good, you want to repeat that. Anything that feels bad, you want to avoid that. So you don't touch a hot stove twice because your brain tells you, hey, that's not gonna be good for you. So this is how the brain works. But of course, your past of what was good and bad is never a perfect guide right. to your future. So we're lucky we have that extra power to tailor this neural network if we're aware of it so that we don't just repeat ourselves. Are you currently suffering from a testosterone deficiency? Are you already using therapeutic testosterone? If you are, go to tottdecoded.com forward slash 10 dash questions and find out the top 10 questions you need to be asking your doctor about therapeutic testosterone. These are critical questions to ask your doctor. If they can't answer them, you need to find another doctor. Why, why, why do you, I love that. Why, why do, why do some people choose to become aware and some don't? So, um, oh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, uh, mm, so there's, I, I would say there's a lot, a lot, why don't I just say how I, how sure. I chose. Um, sure. So. I saw a lot of suffering around me when I was young. And I said, whoa, I don't want to suffer like that. So I tried to understand the suffering. And I never found a really satisfying explanation. I just found like different variations of suffering, sure. you know, sure. with different explanations. So on the one hand, you could say, I haven't changed. I'm like the same little kid that always said, whoa, I'm not going to. Right. partake of your suffering, even though it was expected of me. So 
um, but I kept looking for better explanations. And I looked here and I looked here. And I was sort of fortunate that I had the time to explore different um, varieties um, in my life. Uh, after my kids grew up and left home, I took early retirement and gave myself that time. Awesome. And another thing that was very lucky for me, um, in addition to um, listening, well, I read a lot um, of books about the brain, but then there were audio books. So I could always listen to one whenever I was doing something. So that expanded my knowledge. But I was really lucky that I lived near a place. I lived near um, Berkeley, California, and there was this place that every hour of every day, they had a free lesson from a different practitioner. Wow. So I would go there and I would sit in on these things. And it was the same thing that each, um, each of it's mostly body work, some sure. uh, psychology, philosophy. Um, everyone has their theory and they see their theory as a complete explanation of the world. But because I could get like a free one every hour, like I could sort of extract the common elements so I didn't have to become like a true believer in any one of them. Beautiful. I like that. Um, yeah, it's interesting. We create our own cognitive dissonant echo chambers of life and, you know, how we th feel and think about things. And again, because we are the creator of our reality, we can continue, you know, to believe, know, however you want to phrase it, you know, because that's the reality that we create with our thoughts. It, it, it's, it's, it's very, very interesting you know, to understand that stuff. But yeah, I mean, I'm fascinated by people who do become self-aware and then the people who don't become self-aware. Um, and that's why I asked you that question, because like, for me, it's all about self-awareness. Like how much more can I learn about not just the world, but myself and, you know, learning about myself, then how can I, you know, serve, you know, what I call, you know, humanity creation, you know, at my highest and best capacity as much as I can, you know, so that's kind of the path for me, but that's, that's awesome. Um, I do the same thing. I mean, I read prolifically, you know, spiritual philosophers, um, metaphysical teachers, uh, a lot of science too. So it's, we have very similar paths. Um, you, the second point you have is why, why are happy brain chemicals are not meant to be on all the time? Yeah. So it's so valuable to know this. So the happy brain chemicals are dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, right. and endorphin. Right. And the sort of modern medical model that you hear everywhere is the expectation that constant good feelings is the natural default state. And mm. it's so not true. Mm. So when you know the job right. that these chemicals do in animals, you know that they're meant to turn on in very specific situations in animals. And we know this because animals can't like, withhold their responses or cover them up with their verbal brain. So you see, oh, this chemical has this particular job and that's when it turns on and then it turns off. So you're not meant to have them flowing all the time. And in fact, that's why we drive ourselves crazy trying to do things that stimulate them. Right. Right. It's true. It's true. It's, uh, you know, I like to say, <clears throat> and again, so many people say the, say, say the opposite, but like I, you know, happiness is a transient state, whereas joy, you know, is an actual chosen state of being. And you can choose joy whenever you want. It doesn't matter whether it's raining or it's sunny or you have a million dollars in your bank account or zero, you know, and that and that's where people, I think, I think the path, most people get lost on the path again because of, you know, call it the matrix, call it the narrative, call it the mainstream, whatever you want, that tells them that they you know, have to be a specific way or have to have certain things to feel happiness. And, and, and again, happiness isn't even anything other than, again, according to the happy hormones, transient, you know, just biologically wired, it's transient. It, it can't be anything other than transient. So you have to get to a place consciously where you choose to be, you know, I mean, you're not ever going to be in a pure state of joy. You know, nobody's, Yes, exactly. And, <laughs> and you can really make yourself miserable with that unrealistic expectation. Right. So that's the first thing to say is that many people are trying to 
sort of burden you with your that you're supposed to feel joy all the time. Right. I mean, it's you could say it's just a matter of definition, whatever you call joy. But right. to actually feel the chemistry right. is like just be grateful for it when it comes. That's right. Put yourself in situations that promote it. But don't burden yourself with that unrealistic expectation. But one thing you can always have is, like you said, is to have um, a positive mindset of looking for the positive in every situation right. that you find yourself in. Yeah, and that's that, and that's that's the best strategy because, like you said, I mean, life is a roller coaster, right? You remember the old Nissan commercial, "Enjoy the ride." I mean, I still think about, you know, how profound that commercial was, whether they actually realized, you know, cause it was the, the trademark advertising slogan for the Nissan back in the nineties. But I mean, you know, that really is the purpose of our experience here. You know, I mean, I, I could go much more deeper metaphysically and tell you that it's to give and receive love. Yes. Right. But, uh, the truth is, is that we are on a roller coaster ride and it's our, our labels and perceptions are just that right? Like everything, yes. you, everything yes. you label bad or good is just, you know, a linear statement for how you felt in the moment. And then, you know, so many people get trapped over their life, labeling things or condemning things or judging things that were an experience, like you said, that just, you know, it was a very short, finite experience of your existence. And now you've like trapped yourself and attached to the energy of that moment and it's now affecting you in your whole life. Whereas if you actually have a little bit more clarity and you're, again, you're more self-aware, you can look at that experience being an ult the ultimate opportunity. Yes. And um, here's a very simplistic example of, of enjoying the ride. So about 30 years ago, I, I'm almost exactly 30 years ago, I discovered audiobooks, And so I always had one when I was driving in the car with me. And if I have an audio book that I don't like, then I just don't listen to it and right. I get one I like. So I'm always enjoying my ride of wherever I'm driving. And right. so if there is a backup, I'm enjoying it. Whereas if I would be listening to either the news, commercials, right. or some audio book that was filling my head with fear, then right. I would not be enjoying the ride. That's right. Yeah. And isn't that, isn't that, isn't that unbelievable? Because according to this great wisdom teacher, 80% of people are filling their minds with fear at all times. Yeah. So it's like, yeah. Yeah. how can the planet from a consciousness perspective truly overcome that collective conscious mindset, which again, if yeah. it's 80%, you know, I mean, I, I do, I really do think Loretta that people are, a lot more people are consciously, you know, like you hear they're waking up. It's the great awakening. But I, I do believe, and I won't say believe, I don't like that word, but I, 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 I'll say, I know that there are people waking up now in droves from a standpoint of like, they're not as connected and hooked to that external, you know, call it fear porn narrative that they, that they once were They're They're seeking, seeking or, or, or uh, reaching out, for deeper meaning. Yeah. Um, and we can also forgive people who had it. Like when I learned about my mother's life, which mostly was after she was gone, like she had good reason to live in fear. And when you study history, you see like people really had horrible lives. Yeah, right. I mean, just a, one simple example is like boys were drafted. Right. Wars were constant. And you'd face this row of guns and you were just right. expected to run into the row right. of guns. And right. you knew that like either you'd get killed or that you'd take a prisoner and get tortured or something right. like this is what most people, you know, and then people thought, well, then after you die, you're going to go to hell. And then, <laughs> <laughs> right. And, so you know, women, I think my mom still believes that. And women were beaten and right. they, that was like the norm. Yeah. You had no recourse. So, yeah. you know, really people had reason to live in fear. And what distresses me today, that's my only beef that I'm always upset about. I have, like today, everyone is being indoctrinated to yes. believe that they're traumatized yes. despite the fact that we have such good and comfortable and easy right. lives. Yeah. And that really annoys me. It's crazy. Yeah, no, we could go really deep on that. Um, well, to go back to what you originally, you said a lot there, lots to unpack. Um, 
Yeah. I mean, think of just our parents. They came from the depression. Yeah. I mean, and people, worse. I mean, there were even worse things in the depression, but yeah. Yeah. Exactly. But you know what I mean? Like they yeah. really have memories of food lines. Yes. I mean, I mean, you, you know, to, to, to your point of now, like, you know, everybody's coddled and has an app for everything and instant gratification and yeah. you know, there's no worry and pain and suffering. Like you just said, it's like to, to truly not have food. Yes. To truly be hungry yes. and your parents say, sorry, sorry, I can't get any food. Yeah. Right. That's yeah. exactly right. And so that mindset slash uh, memory you know, latent, whatever you want to call it, yes. that definitely has been transferred into their, to their kids and, and daughters. Cause I mean, again, I, I, I can only tell, tell you about my mom and dad. I mean, my mom and dad both have always had poverty consciousness, you know, lack, limitation, scarcity mindsets. And I know they got that from their parents because they were there when this happened. I mean, my dad was born in 1945 and my mom was born in 46. And so it was at the tail end of all of that. But their parents, you know, lived through that. And so their parents, I mean, I, I have a funny story. My grandfather, before he died, he lived till he was 96. Uh, my grandmother died before him and we all thought he wouldn't live, you know, six months because she waited on him hand and foot, but he lived another nine years. And so he spent time with his grandkids. And one time when I, this is a long time ago, but when I was living in Atlanta and I was in my twenties, he came down and I took him out shopping and we went to a grocery store and we went to a clothing store and he would go up to the food and he would like inspect it. He would smell it. He would look at it really closely and he would say, Jay boy, this is some fine shrimp and, or, so, or whatever. I, I remember this very, very vis viscerally. And, and I was like, grandpa, let me buy you a pound of that. He was like, Oh no, 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 no. We stopped buying shrimp once it went over 13 cents a pound. And I was like, <laughs> wow. And then I went to the clothing store after that. And he would go up to the garments and he would smell them and he would fold them and he would feel the consistency uh, or the constituency. And he would say, wow, these are really fine threads. He's like, I wonder what it would like to wear a shirt like this. And the same thing, grandpa, let me buy you that shirt. No, 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 absolutely not. And so, you know, you, you could see the conditioning and the beliefs. And again, that was to me the depressionary mindset. And so I, for me, at least I got a chance to viscerally feel what he felt. Yes, yes, exactly. And his memories were visceral, exactly. And people should understand how this happens because it happened to all of us. So like I said, your neurons are not connected when you're born and they connect right. from experience. So what is experience? It's three things. So one is anytime anything, anything feels good or bad, the good yeah. feeling is a chemical, the bad feeling is a chemical, and it's your brain signal this is important information, hold on to it. Because for our distant ancestors, they were foraging. And when you found food, right. you felt good. And it wired you, how can I find more of this kind of food? When you found a predator, you're like, whoa, how can I avoid locations with predators? So we got wired by those good moments and those bad moments without conscious awareness. The second thing is repetition, anything that was good or bad repeatedly. And the third is when you're young, you have neuroplasticity because of what's called myelin, which um, right. it insulates right. neurons the way right. um, a wire is insulated, and that makes the neurons much faster. So you, your native language is myelinated neurons. When you learn a foreign language and you can't find a word, that's what it's like when a neuron is not myelinated because right. you didn't learn it when you were young. So that's why we so easily gravitate to these early circuits. Are you using therapeutic peptides? Are you a new user, maybe an advanced user? Maybe you're considering starting peptides. Highly recommend going to the link right below the peptidescourse.com forward slash 10 dash mistakes and download my PDF and learn what not to do before starting therapeutic peptides. How, how, in, in, uh, I'm very familiar with the myelin sheath, but like, uh, can maybe give some advice because it seems like you would probably know, like, for somebody, uh, who is attempting to learn a second or third language, you know, as an adult, like, what are some tips that you might want to give? Because I might know somebody. 
Okay, great. Um, yeah, so the first thing I always talk about how animal trainers work is to give yourself a small reward for a small step. So if you want to learn a language, you know, break it down into small steps and give yourself small rewards for taking each step. And everyone can define that in their own way. Um, so the next thing is to make it fun. And I have to say that I studied languages for years. And when I tried to speak them, I had this sense of shame and embarrassment, which is completely unnecessary. And I wish it didn't take me so long to learn otherwise. But like a simple example is um, practice with waiters and waitresses. Mm. Um, practice in low stress situations so that you get over that fear of like, you're projecting that the other person is condemning you <laughs> and laughing at you and focused on, oh, you American. That's all indoctrination that we don't need. Yeah. The way I got over that way too late is I was invited into this group um, and we would meet once a week and have wine and cheese. It was other Americans and we would talk to each other and you just had to fill the two hours. So I just yammered away and you just, once you get over the hump and you just yammer away and then you get used to it. And then I was able to do it. <laughs> Very interesting. What languages were you speaking? Fr well, that was French, but I do French and Spanish and a little bit of Italian. Very, very cool. Oh, and the other um, thing is movies. So when you watch a movie and you see the subtitle, but you listen to the language and you see the English, and I, I found that it just went in. And after a while, you know, I, it, like, and it was fun. So make it fun. I like that. Um, before I let you go, you're a pretty fascinating person. Uh, what did you share that we haven't spoken about today on this show? You Thank out. you for asking that. So um, social comparison is the big thing that I learned from animals. So there was a whole century of research on monkeys and other animals. They're very competitive. So anyone who lives with wild animals sees how nasty they are to each other. And today we've gotten this sanitized view that animals are all loving and cooperative, but really they're totally nasty, to, not totally, but like a large percentage of their time, they're very competitive. Yeah. And the reason is that it spreads their genes and right. natural selection built a brain that rewards you with a good feeling when you gain the one-up position because that spreads your genes. But if you try to get the one-up position, but you're really not strong enough, then the other one will harm you. So the animal brain is constantly comparing itself to others. And that's why we drive ourselves crazy with social comparison. That's how our brain is designed to work. So when you see that you have the position of strength, your brain releases a little bit of serotonin. And this is not what we've heard by serot about serotonin, but this was discovered from monkey research in the 80s. And you could go to my serotonin page, innermammalinstitute.org slash serotonin. When you see that you're in the position of weakness, your brain releases cortisol, the stress chemical. And that tells you to pull back to protect yourself from getting into a fight that you lose. And if you watch nature videos, uh, especially the older ones, this is sort of, this was common knowledge. Any introductory textbook on evolutionary biology or psychology has this, but suddenly it's covered up. So that's why I want people to know. I love that. Um, I, I definitely have to tell you a funny story. So in my house, we have a Yorkie and a pit bull and they're both <laughs> purebred. And of course the Yorkie is the alpha and, you know, dominates the pit bull in ways that it just, it's absolutely hilarious. I mean, they're both totally loved dogs. I mean, you know, my wife puts pictures of them all the time, uh, you know, on social media with the Yorkie sitting in the middle, you know, like the lion and the pit bull and his little tiny uh, place where he's supposed to be right Inter interchange. But you're right. I mean, it, it, it is a mentality and a mindset and the Yorkie does exert dominance. Like he will attack and nip and bite and chew, you know, at the pit 
even though it's crazy because we both know that the pit could just like one time him and it would be over. So it's amazing how that works in nature. It's the expectations you built in your early experience about your relative strength that right. is wired in and then it guides your life and you let it drive you crazy if you do, you know, like that pit bull, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it's totally true. I mean, you know, the Yorkie was here first and then the pit came after and when the pit was just a little puppy, the Yorkie dominated the nest. And, you know, that's, it's still ingrained in him. And it's funny, what you were saying is so true. They don't like each other. They tolerate each other. Yes. Right. There's times that they play, like, you know, we'll catch them playing and it's like the most amazing thing. And then, you know, 10 minutes later, they're attacking each other, you know, yes. again, like you said, attempting to exert dominance. And I've always just kind of likened it to, you know, beyond what you were saying to it's, it's instinctual, it, yes. it, you know, in a lot of ways, what they're doing, like you said, it's just literally instinctual. Yes, but instinctual, but each individual tailored to their own experience. And the, I learned this in a sort of mind-blowing way apart from academic study. So I was a volunteer at the zoo. Now, the zoo management, animal management specialists who are very trained and very responsible, sure. their job is to protect that pit bull, the less dominant individual from right. getting injured. So that's their job. But then with their public face, they can't admit that the Yorkie is actually aggressive. So they spin that's it true. and they cover it up. That's Maybe true. your wife does this, right? So that's what I lived with. It drove me nuts. It's totally true. The Yorkie is a rat. He causes but you all cover the it up and, and maybe your wife says, oh, he's just this and he's just that, right? Isn't that funny? But that that's also, I think, part instinctual because in our minds, we're literally labeling and judging that the little dog needs to be protected, right? Well, which they do because when you're in a zoo, your job is to protect right. the, the weaker individuals right. because they're enclosed. But then to lie about... Right the abuse of the stronger one is, is what bothered me. <laughs> yeah. That's actually kind of crazy how that really does work in life. I mean, what, why do people do that? It's like a cognitive dissonance because of the size differentiation. I think we want to have this happy ending you <laughs> and like, um, we want the Walt Disney ending. <laughs> yeah. Although I was amazed that all Disney movies have, um, honesty about animals as much as I was, I yeah. wanted to call it the Disneyfied, but Disney movies are actually more honest. It's so I, I blame academia, but I have to say that that's where I spent my life. So everybody sort of blames their own little world that they know. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Uh, dog, I find dogs so utterly fascinating because my pit bull is literally my, you know, my spirit animal. I mean, he's right here. <laughs> laying down at the ground right now. And when he goes outside, when I meditate in the morning, he comes out and literally lays and grounds next to me, you know, as I'm meditating and it's just the most profound thing. And then, you know, I've also wondered sometimes too, if they, you know, because obviously they have a different vision prism than we do. Like, what are they seeing sometimes when they just bark, you know, like you're thinking like, okay, my dog is barking at nothing, but it's like, are they seeing something, you know, outside of our vision prism, you know, maybe energies or entities or something, because like you can tell that they really are becoming responsive. Like they want to protect you. I mean, it's the most amazing thing. I mean, I've noticed this on my dogs yeah. over like the last six years, especially outside at dusk. So it's not mm. dark, but it's like that time where the sun has gone down, but it's still light. Yes. That's when predators hunt. Right. That's great. Wow. That's amazing. But you know, the filtered way that we hear, I have a great example of that. So my little grandson, he gets all excited when he hears a beep, beep, beep. You know, when a truck backs up and sure, there's a beep, sure, beep, sure. he gets so excited. So I put him in the stroller and I took him out for a walk to look for trucks beeping. <laughs> so the weird thing is, I was looking with my eyes rather than listening. I was right. looking for trucks because I wanted to catch it. Sure. But he was listening with his ears. So whenever he heard a car honking the horn, he said, beep, 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 beep. And I was like, no, there's nothing. But like, you yeah. know, because I was yeah. filtering the information and all he cared about was the sound. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. 
That's crazy. So I didn't think about that. So the hunt, it's the hunting time. So again, is that just, they're just wired that way. Wow. Mm. Amazing. No matter how much we domesticate, you know what they say? You can't, you can't take the jungle sometimes out of the animal, yeah. right? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Truly amazing. Well, Dr. Loretta, you are truly a source of inspiration for me and amazing information. This is a profound podcast. Um, if somebody wants to you know, connect with you, work with you, obviously podcast with you, um, where would you have them send besides intermammalinstitute.org? Where else? Oh, well, in, um, <clears throat> excuse me. I think intermammalinstitute.org has everything. So I should say okay. it has all of my social media, all of my books, all of my own podcast and my guest appearances, but it has my free resources. So I have free yeah. videos. I have a YouTube channel and I have a free five day happy chemical jump start. So when you go on my website, you can um, opt in and you get one email a day for five days explaining each of the four happy chemicals and one unhappy chemical. Beautiful. Very, very amazing. All right. Well, listen, I really appreciate you coming on. So guys and gals and all the amazing folks that will be watching this podcast when it airs, please always support the amazing individuals like Dr. Loretta who come on the Jay Campbell podcast. Go to her website, intermammalinstitute.org, opt in and remember, raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. We will see all of you guys very soon. Thank you.